Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes with the Clark College Network Technology Department. We're in NTEC 222, our Cisco CCNA 2 course, studying Chapter 4, Switched Networks. There's two sections to this short chapter. One is on LAN design and the second on the switched environment. Let's go into LAN design. Our digital world is changing. There's a growing complexity of networks, a lot more mobile devices, and a lot more inter-campus and intra-campus security concerns. Uh, the switch has become a more powerful tool for addressing many of these. The router is still important for an edge device protecting our company's boundary to the internet and to the external world. But inside our company, more and more, we're using switches, layer two switches, layer three switches, to address our security and connectivity concerns. Elements of a converged network. Traditionally, we had separate networks. There was a network for video, sometimes called CATV, or video conferencing, and they often use coaxial cabling. We also had a telephone network. We had business phones and phone, um, voicemail systems and called a PBX, and all of those use proprietary wiring, uh, typically the RJ11 and the type of uh, phone wiring you still see common in homes today. But businesses have moved on and they've changed the wiring and infrastructure for their voice and video networks to be the same as the data network. So everything is sent now as a data packet on an ethernet cable or wirelessly across a Wi-Fi network. So your phones and your video and your data and everything else are all converged onto one wire infrastructure. They all use ethernet switches and routers and servers and the same kinds of things that we use for email and file transfer and all the various things that we do on our network. This has many advantages, primarily cost savings. We have one wire infrastructure to maintain and design and we have one uh, one IT team to train on managing and uh, controlling and securing all of these things. Cisco calls the concept of being able to work at home or remote locations and still have secure connections the Cisco Borderless Network. That's essentially just VPNs. So the primary tool that Cisco uses to accomplish a borderless network is a VPN. We're, um, in this case, just talking about the concept of a borderless network. The idea is that when you leave the company buildings, when you go from room to room, the network doesn't end. It continues in your access to it. Whether you hop on your iPhone at lunch or you're at home on your laptop, you still have access to many of the work resources that you would have in your office in the job workplace. Seamless integration of your data, your applications, and your connectivity. To accomplish this, we need a network design model, and we have one, and it can be adapted into a second called compressed um, model or collapsed. The first is the classic three-tier model. You'll need to know this for the Cisco exam. Uh, the CSENT and the CCNA both test you on the understanding of the three-tier model. You have an access, a distribution, and a core. Access is where the printers and the phones and the people connect their devices. This is where you'd find things like Wi-Fi and power over Ethernet, uh, you know, to power some of those devices. Those kind of technologies are found there. And at the access layer, we want a lot of ports and we don't want to pay a lot for them. So we usually find switches with few features, but a lot of ports. And then at the distribution layer, that's where we aggregate a lot of that bandwidth. So fewer ports, higher speeds, and security is implemented in the distribution. Then we move on to the core where we have even fewer ports, typically all fiber and um, high speed. No need for security because that's already been accomplished at our distribution layer. So the borderless network is one that provides a hierarchical, as you see here in the three tier hierarchy or the compressed two tier hierarchy. It gives modularity where new functions can be added without having to tear down the network and rebuild it. So we want a network that's hierarchical, modular, resilient, and flexible. So keep those uh, four um, words in mind, possibly in your notes as you move into the chapter test 
they'll definitely test you on what are the advantages to a borderless network. And it's a hierarchical network that's modular, resilient, and flexible. The reason for the two-tier model is for smaller networks that don't require a separate distribution and core. They could compress those functions into a single core distribution, handling both the security and the high speed in a single core. This is an example of how the three cores work together to interconnect various facilities if you had different branch um, sites connected to a main headquarters. You would find you have a core, which consists of your internal WAN links between the sites and all of your uh, servers that are enterprise wide. Then down at the distribution layer, you would have more localized servers and you would find firewalls and uh, routers and layer three switches. And then at the access layer, you would find stacks and stacks of switches and ports. Switching technologies are crucial to network design. The router really has a diminished role in the modern network. Again, handling most of the on-network, off-network traffic that might be going to or from the internet. Now today, that can be up to 70 or 80% of our traffic. So the router is certainly busy, but the distribution of traffic within the LAN is going to be the switches. So the switches are formed in what they call a switching fabric. And that fabric is going to be in the three layers you see here at the bottom, the access layer where the devices exist and connect to the network. That's where they access the network. Then you have the distribution layer, which is our aggregation layer. Aggregation means simply taking a lot of ports and pushing them out on fewer ports. And you can see that example here. So if fewer higher speed ports. Additionally, we often do our security and filtering at this layer. And then they move on to, if you will, the highway or freeway, which is the core of the network, which is where we have all the WAN links and the routers and the enterprise servers. And everything has been you know, vetted and filtered and aggregated at that point. So it just hops on there and goes at high speed to where it needs to. Let's talk about the different form factors of LAN switches. So you can purchase a LAN switch several different ways. You can get one in what's called a fixed configuration, like the ones you see here, where there's really nothing to expand. These actually have, if you look closely, there's a couple what we call SFP or small form factor ports. Um, so there's a small amount of expansion. As you go down, there's four of them on the bottom two, but the upper, um, up, oh, actually the second one down is four as well. But the um, first and the third only have two of those SFP ports. Those are ports that are basically there, that, but they don't have a transceiver module already pre-installed. So it saves you a little bit of money and then you can buy those transceivers later and add an extra couple ports. Um, it's a popular expansion option, but it's still almost a fixed configuration switch. A truly fixed configuration switch, you can't add or modify any of the ports. It is what it is. And when you don't like it anymore, you you have to just replace the entire switch. There your lowest cost switch would be, um, your lowest cost per port is a fixed configuration switch. You move up from that to what we call modular or expandable switches where you can add modules. Some of Cisco's higher end switches don't even come with ports per se. They come only with empty module. Um, it's really just a chassis that you buy all the ports you want and shove them in there. So you can change ports around, you can switch from fiber to copper to wireless, and you can plug in all kinds of different things that are very modular. That starts around the uh, 4000 series for Cisco switches. So anything 3000 and below is mostly fixed configuration. And then 4000 is the transitional kind of point. And those are model numbers. Uh, if you know anything about automobiles, the higher the model number, the nicer the automobile, right? So a six series is nicer than a three series and an eight or nine would be even more luxe. It's same with Cisco switches. So if you have a one or two series, you've got really kind of the bargain basement fixed configuration switches. And then threes are kind of nicer. They have uh, really the same features as fours, but they're not modular. You add modularity with a, with a four. So you see some of those here. Here's four, five, six, seven um, thousand series switches that you can um, see are modular. They have cards that slide in and out and they look very different. Uh, they're bulkier, right? Because they have to be larger to accommodate changing the modules. You also have to be able to change the power supplies. 
uh, one thing to think about, right, is different modules or different ports have different power requirements. So the switch will come with a power supply that you order. Anybody who's built a PC themselves knows this. You have to put a different power supply in your PC depending how much RAM and how many hard drives and what kind of CPUs and that sort of thing. It's the same when you have a modular chassis. You can't have a one size fits all power supply. So once you go to modular, you have to be able to change the power supply. And some of these, you can also upgrade the CPU, uh, the main logic board, all kinds of things can be uh, modularly upgraded. Another feature that's popular with switches is called stacking. Now this isn't modularity, this is the ability to have several switches function as one. So essentially you could add ports to a switch through modularity but only to the extent that you have modules. Well with stackable switches you can just buy more switches and stack them together with special proprietary stacking cables. As shown here they form a loop. The top switch connects to the bottom, which connects to the one above it, which connects to the one above it, which connects to the top switch, which connects back to the bottom. So they're in one big ring or loop. And so in this way, and they're always configured this way, and that's called a stack. And you can actually console into just one of the switches and configure the entire stack once, uh, once they're set to work in a stack. So they have a single config that's shared between the switches. That's kind of cool. And they have uh, the ability to move your frames from one switch to another at the back plane speed, which is uh, something really high, like probably 480 gigabits per second, something really fast, which is the speed that the motherboard functions at, not the port speed. So port speed is when you put a, maybe you put a cable between two switches, you've probably done this in one of your Cisco labs, where you trunk two switches together, you were um, hampered by the speed of the port, probably a one gig port. And so all the ports on one switch are being connected to another at the front port speed. Well, if you look closely, you notice you don't really have enough front um, ports to accommodate all the bandwidth of all the ports. And so a stacking gives you uh, no bandwidth constriction. You get a uh, full bandwidth. So essentially it turns it into an expandable switch. Usually you can stack up to about 12 to 15 switches in a stack. This is a feature that costs about an extra thousand dollars per switch. You have to purchase it at the time. You know, you have to decide if you want to switch with the stacking feature. And so uh, that starts with Cisco 3000 series. 2000 and 1000 switches don't offer stacking. And as I say, it costs about thousand dollars more to add stacking to a um, similarly comparable switch that doesn't have it. Okay, well that's it for the first section, which uh, really just kind of talked about the different types of switches that you see out there. Let's start talking about the switched environment. So we know that switches make a decision based on the ingress and destination port. So they look at who the frame is from, the MAC address that sent the frame. They also look at who the frame is to. They look up the destination, or two address in what's called a CAM or MAC address table, and that allows them to make a rapid forwarding decision, sometimes before the entire frame has arrived. So they can actually, while the bits of the frame are coming in the ingress port, they can look at that first field in the frame, which is the destination MAC address, and they can go ahead and look that up in the table and start switching the bits out the egress port even though all the bits haven't even arrived. So imagine that uh, the bits are still arriving from this frame and they're already being sent on. So that's why switches are sometimes called low or ultra low latency devices. They switch at almost wire speed. There's almost an imperceptible delay in a switch that's working like that. What you may know or may not remember from Cisco One is that switches in this CAM or MAC address table, CAM just is a uh, content addressable memory. So that was the old term we used for this. We often call it the MAC address table today, but in a lot of books, you'll still see it referred to as the CAM table. CAM is a special type of RAM called content addressable memory instead of RAM, which is random access memory. You don't really have to know that. So today we call it the MAC address table, and that table is blank when a switch powers on. 
You don't program it. It learns on its own. It dynamically populates itself as frames arrive. So when a frame arrives, the switch looks up the destination Mac in that table. If it finds it, fine. It goes ahead and switches it or forwards it to the egress port that's specified. If it doesn't find it, what it usually does then is it sends out a broadcast that says, hey, who's got this Mac address? We call that an ARP. So it'll send an ARP request that says, hey, who's got this Mac? And when that device responds back, gotcha. It knows what port that device is on, adds it to the CAM table, and it can immediately then start forwarding that frame. So that frame that doesn't have a, a you know defined port, that first frame in the message, that's gonna get a little bit of a delay. In fact, it can sometimes get long enough of a delay that, um, that a ping might even fail. I mean, it could be that long. So when we talk about how fast switches are, that's presuming that the cam table is already pre-populated. It populates pretty fast. It usually only takes a couple minutes, uh, two to five minutes, and your cam table is fully populated for the network because devices are pretty chatty. So remember, um, a device doesn't wait for the switch to ask it what its MAC is. Every time a device is communicating, it is sharing its MAC address at the switch, which is constantly updating the table. This is helpful if a device moves from one port to another, like a wireless device that might be on one access point and then moves to another room or building is now present on, on a different access point. The switch will know that pretty quickly because that device is going to try to continue to communicate on that new access point, and the switch will just simply move the MAC address over to the new port. Let's talk about the different forwarding methods that switches can use. There's really two, although we'll expand that into three. It's gonna be weird, but hang with me. There's two standard forwarding methods. Store and forward, which should pretty much make sense to you, the switch would uh, receive the frame on the ingress port, store the entire frame, and then it analyzes it, it does the CRC redundancy check to make sure the frame has no wares, and then it goes ahead and looks it up in the forwarding table and moves it on to the egress port and on its way it goes. So all the bits of the frame come in one by one by one and they're stored in a special area of RAM while they come in and once they all arrive, it processes the CRC field at the end of that frame to verify there's been no errors in the transmission. At that point, if it passes the CRC check, it will look up the destination address in the CAM uh, MAC address table and forward it on. Well, I talked earlier in this lecture about cut through, which is an even faster way to do it. Essentially, the switch just reads enough of the frame to determine the destination MAC address, looks that up in the um, CAM MAC address table and forwards it immediately onto the egress port. So the bits are moving on out the egress port while there are other bits in that frame are still arriving on the ingress port. Obviously, the consequence of this is you can't do the CRC redundancy check. That checks at the far end of the frame. So you don't even get those bits until you've moved on the entire frame. So it'd be pointless to see if there's an error because it's too late. You've already moved those bits on down the wire. So this is uh, something you can do on a highly reliable part of your network is called cut through switching. If you're having errors where you've got a high error rate with frames, maybe you look at the network settings, you look at a NIC and it has a lot of um, ethernet errors in the frames, you need to switch those ports over to store and forward. Store and forward is automatically implemented even if you've selected cut through when the ingress and egress ports are dissimilar speeds. So for cut through to work, the ingress and egress port must be the same speed, one gig to one gig, you know, 10 meg to 10 meg. But if they're not, if say it's coming in on a 10 meg port and it's going out on a 100 meg port, it can't use cut through because you, you can't move the bits out at the same speed they're coming in. You get that it can't be in sync because they're moving it at very different speeds. You'd have to use store and forward. So the switch will automatically revert to store and forward for those frames. Um, even if you've specified cut through because it's just impossible to use cut through in some cases. So again, store and forward, checks the CRC or FCS, remember it has two names. One is the name of the, um, of the field in the frame and the other is the name of the mathematical formula. And cut through, no CRC, right? 10 microseconds of delay, right? So you have about 10 microseconds of delay. 
of course, it can't do any buffering or checking. It's sending it out pretty quickly. I mean, it's the first usable field in the frame. You can see there's a reason that they put the destination address first in an Ethernet frame. If you look and ever wondered in Cisco One, wouldn't it be source and destination? Why is it destination and then source, right? So it is destination and source so that information of where it's going is available as soon as possible. Collision domains. So this is another thing to keep in mind is that switches can operate in half or full duplex and that's a port by port decision. So if it's one device on the port, it's going to be full duplex. If you connect a hub um, where you have multiple devices sharing the port speed, then it's going to be half duplex. Half duplex doesn't mean half speed. It's even slower than half speed. It means that you can have collisions. Right? So to have a collision-free environment, that is a collision domain of one, as shown here in the illustration with PCA connecting to switch two. That would be called micro-segmented, which means that we have a full duplex link between the device and the switch port. This is ideal and what you want to attain. Broadcast domains. Broadcast domains are a different concept, and they're all the devices that can hear a broadcast. That would be an FFFFF frame. And if you sent an FFF frame, every port on the switch in that VLAN would hear it. So they are limited to um, two VLANs, but every port will hear them. So what stops a broadcast? A router. Switches extend broadcast domains. So if you cable three or four switches together, you're making your broadcast domains larger. To alleviate network congestion, we have to keep these ideas in mind. We're really going to want to try to provide full duplex communication. That's the ability to send and receive simultaneously. Half duplex means send then receive. And you can have collisions. So with full duplex, you can have a collision free environment where you're sending and receiving simultaneously versus send then receive only one talking on the link um, area on the um, collision domain at a time, and collisions are likely to happen. So we want to avoid collisions entirely by shrinking our collision domains to one, meaning they're micro-segmented. So we want to take full advantage of um, port density, in other words, one device per port. We want to um, try to increase our switching speed with using cut through or fast forward switching so that we're using a uh, switching that's not store and forward so we can improve the speed, get that, that, that speed really fast. And that's really what we cover in this chapter. Let's take a look. At this point, you should be able to explain how switch networks support small to medium sized businesses. You should be able to explain how data, voice and video are converged into a single switch network. You'll be able to describe a switched network in a small to medium sized business, explain how layer two switches forward data, that would be that broadcast inclusion domain and how they keep a CAM MAC address table, those things, explain how frames are forwarded. Remember we talked about storm forward and we also talked about the fast forward and compare a collision domain to a broadcast domain. Thank you.